tonight for our special Valentine's Day Agape Latte, we are excited to welcome a well-loved member of the BC community, Dan Ponsetto. Dan is not only the director of the Wells Remy Crowther Volunteer and Service Learning Center, but he's also a proud father of four children and his wife, Susie, who, believe it or not, has been his sweetheart since the seventh grade. And although that might sound like a fairy tale, Dan is here to share the wisdom that comes from a nearly lifelong love story and what he's learned from sharing so many phases of their lives together. Many of you may know Dan from the Wells Remy Crowther Red Bandana Run in October, from his many trips to South America with Yerupe volunteers, from taking one of his many theology classes, or joining one of the countless programs offered through the VSLC. A man who wears many hats and has offered his gifts to the BC community for decades, we're lucky to have him with us tonight. So please join me in giving an agape latte welcome to Dan Ponsetto. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Kate and Eileen, and hello. So it's Valentine's Day, and you're sharing it with me. How special. The pressure's on. I hope that this is, I'm, I promise you that this will not be your greatest Valentine ever. But if it is, I'll be very happy. I don't need this, right? OK. So um, I'm really thrilled to be asked to, to speak. Uh, the topic is love. I think you just went over in the trivia the three words that, that are often used in scripture. And today, we're going to be talking about agape, primarily. I'm going to be talking about it. And I'm going to be talking about love. I'm going to tell some stories. And I'm going to be talking about love as both a noun and a verb. Uh, and so um, to help me get started, I've asked three friends to come up here, if you can. Yeah, I think you probably need to, yeah, so we can hear the thing. And they're going to do three readings. There's three things I wanted them to read. Uh, one of these you probably are familiar with. You might know them all. Uh, and this would kind of give a little context for my talk. Okay. This is a, this no. is a quote from... Turn. Oh. There you go. This is a quote from Father Pedro Arupe, who was the Superior General of the Jesuit Order from 1965 to 1983. Nothing is more practical than finding God, than falling in love in an absolute final way. What you are in love with, what seizes your imagination, will affect everything. It will decide what you will get up out of bed for in the morning, what you do with your evenings, how you spend your weekends, what you read, whom you know, what breaks your heart, and what amazes, amazes you with joy and gratitude. Fall in love, stay in love, and it will decide everything. This quote is taken from the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Love in action is a harsh and dreadful thing compared to love in dreams. Love in dreams is greedy for immediate action, rapidly performed, and in the sight of all. Men will give their lives if only the ordeal does not last long but is soon over, with all looking on and applauding as though on the stage. But active love is labor and fortitude. And for some people, too, perhaps a complete science. And finally, um, this quote is from a Ben & Jerry's ice cream bumper sticker. If it's not fun, why do it? Thank you very much. Come here. <laughs> Phil asked for the one-liner. Um, so uh, Kate's already given away a little bit about myself uh, in telling you about my marriage. Uh, I am married to a beautiful woman, uh, and I did meet her in seventh grade. Here's how it went down. Uh, so in seventh, I grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Very exciting place. I'm sure you've vacationed there. And uh, anyone from anywhere near Grand Rapids, Michigan? We'll meet afterwards and, and, uh, and have t swap stories. I know, yeah, I know you're from there. <laughs> so, um, we, yeah. Um, so what happens in, in Grand Rapids before, you know, back in the wonder years, in my era, they hadn't invented middle school yet. It was junior high school, okay? And so when I went to Woodcliffe Elementary School, it was K through six. And there were about four or five other elementary schools in my town. And going to seventh grade was a huge social step up because suddenly you were, I was moving beyond the orbit of the Woodcliffe squirrels. That was our mascot, the squirrels and going to be meeting all these other seventh grade children from four, I think, four other elementary schools. Big deal. 
And the first event that took place in seventh grade, as I recall it, was a high school football game. Uh, the high school football game was a Friday night, and it was the Friday night before school even started. So we hadn't even stepped foot in the junior high school, and there we were. And my memory of it, it was that there was, are there any rugby players here? There was about a 120-person scrum of seventh graders, all just kind of clinging to each other and walking around like a big amoeba, or that wouldn't be the right thing. But we we're behind the stands, and we're all kind of hanging on to, I'm with my Woodcliffe buddies, and there are all these other seventh graders, and we're checking each other out. And as I looked through the scrum, there she was. I can still see her. There was her face, this beautiful girl. And I didn't know who she was, and we didn't have Facebook or anything like that. I couldn't pull up my phone. So I gathered together what you did back in that day. You had to you know, get friends to go over there and ask, you know, maybe write a note to somebody. And so the delegation from Woodcliffe made contact with the Lakeside School uh, members. And before the night was over, I learned that her name was Susie Robinson. And uh, before long, once she decided on me rather than Peter Arnold, we were dating, okay? Now, Peter Arnold, uh, this is the key, because she did tell me, well, it was either you or Peter Arnold. And I'm convinced now, I know it for a fact, that we had a German shepherd who was having puppies. And I invited some of her friends and, and her to come over to my house and see these puppies. And that put me right over the top. Peter Alford didn't stand a chance. That's a true story. So now, uh, what we did in seventh grade is we went together. That's what it is. When I wanted, if you like someone, you say, do you want to go together? Is that common now? No. Does that sound crazy? Do you want to go together? So we were going together. We never went anywhere except maybe to, you know, the phone to call each other at night. I don't remember ever going anywhere with her, but we went together. That was what dating, whatever dating was, was. Dating was seeing each other in the morning at the locker and eventually calling her every freaking night on the telephone. And not on a cell phone, on a big corded phone with five, I have, four brother, I have four other siblings and a mom and a dad that want that phone sometimes. So I had to call her every night and God knows what we talked about. Eight months, eight months we went together. That's still an East Grand Rapids junior high record. It's in the, it's in the behind glass, the record for going together for the longest. Eight months. Then she dropped me. Dropped. Is that, you know? Dropping? She dropped me. She dumped me. And I remember I was babysitting at my neighbor's house and we were making the nightly phone call and she dropped me. And I, I literally wept. I cried. Then uh, fast forward to 11th grade. In 11th grade, I was in the high school musical and uh, I was uh, in the show and uh, Sue was head makeup artist and she was doing my makeup. And so when you're doing, has anyone been in a play? Has anyone ever done makeup? That's quite a skill. I had Sue Robinson like touching my face like every show. And her face was like this close to me. So I was making every expression I possibly could to kind of, you know, lure her back in. <laughs> and it worked. And so in 11th grade, we started dating again. And I was in love. Let me tell you, I got back up. In 7th grade, I was so in love, I, you know, I, I, I couldn't talk. And I remember, I want to mention this because it's Valentine's Day. I remember getting construction paper out of a drawer somewhere in my house and scissors. And I was so in love with this girl, I was cutting hearts out. I was using Elmer's glue and pasting it together. I wrote in fancy cursive that I've never used before in my life, you know. I, God knows what I wrote. I made her a Valentine out of, out of real paper and scissors. And Elmer's glue, we weren't like you lazy people with glue sticks. They hadn't invented that yet. We had to use Elmer's glue, right, Karen? So then um, I went to, I also bought her a ring. I went to Spencer Gifts. I still remember, it's still around in the mall. Spencer Gifts, greatest store in the world. Uh, and bought her a ring. God, I spent a lot of money, I'm sure, on that ring. Uh, 11th grade, I was in love again. Oh my gosh, I was beyond, beyond belief. I was back with Sue Robinson and uh, the woman of my dreams. And uh, I went to Meyer Thrifty Acres and I, I bought construction paper. And for her birthday, I made her another card. I cut out, I got the scissors, I used Elmer's glue, I pasted it together, I put flowers on it, and I gave that to her for her birthday. And I also bought her a necklace. That's a big deal, 11th grade. 12th grade came, and we're thinking about going to college. And we went to college together, but we broke up. She dropped me again. 
Uh, we broke up, <clears throat> off we went to college. Sound familiar? Uh, we were at the same school, but it was a large university, and so um, we didn't see each other a whole lot. Toward the end of our time, uh, at, it, 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 it was in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So toward the end of our time, um, we started uh, seeing each other a little bit more, and um, we were doing some different projects on campus that brought us together, uh, and um, we ended up uh, going back out together again. Uh, I was in love. I was crazy in love. This time I bought another ring. A year later, I asked her to marry me, and it's now been, oh my gosh, 34 years. 34 years. Okay, you're supposed to clap now. <clears throat> So, um, here's the deal. Wonderful, lover, great times, great memories. But 34 years. At some point in this relationship, uh, she woke up in the morning and looked over at me and said, huh, <laughs> this is the guy I'm gonna spend the rest of my life with, you know? And what I mean by that is that love is a commitment that lasts longer than being in love. And you know that. It's lovely and wonderful to be in love. Pedro Arupe's quote is great. He says, fall in love, stay in love. And I would like to, as a guy who's been married for 34 years, had four kids, I want to amend his statement. I think that what he meant to say is, fall in love and commit yourself to love. Because love is a verb. It's something you do, and it's not always easy. And if it weren't always easy, if it weren't work, we would never have lasted 34 years. I recently, a couple weeks ago, maybe a week ago, was with the group that just got back from Arupe. And I talked about the fact that we not only fall in love with people, but we fall in love with new ideas. We fall in love with new truths. We fall in love with new convictions, right? You go to a place, you meet people that change your life. And it's a way of falling in love. You go into Boston, and you meet somebody, and you, and you visit with them on a weekly basis, you fall in love with those people, with that community. Uh, but you can't stay in love. You have to commit yourself to it. And the question for the people that I pose to people coming back from Arupe is, you know, I doubt you're gonna go and live the rest of your life in Nicaragua, or in the Dominican Republic, or in Belize, or in Chiapas. But what was it that happened to you there? Who did you meet? That, that, that you'll never want to forget. What, what happened? What conversation? What community? What family? What image has captured you? And now you've got to try to convert it into some type of action. Move from this, this romance of, of, of being moved by this thing and being converted up in your brain, right? But now I want to see it enfleshed somehow in my life. And I know it's gonna take a lifetime, but I wanna remember that family. I wanna remember that conversation because that's gonna be something that's gonna help me continue on this journey of love. It's the commitment, it's the verb love, and it's work. Had a friend named Howie Rich. Howie Rich um, was a guy who lived up on the North Shore of Boston, and I knew Howie in three ways. One, he was a, um, a, a terrific youth minister in the town of Danvers, Massachusetts. He was a teacher in Danvers Public High School, and later in his life, he became a pastor of a congregational church up on the North Shore. How he got brain cancer. He has wife, uh, Rini, and two kids, uh, and um, later on in his life, um, he got brain cancer and uh, struggled mightily against that cancer and heroically. Uh, wrote beautifully about hope uh, and um, and shared a lot of his journey with his family and with his friends. When Howie died, I, um, I went up to the funeral. And it was in a big congregational church in Danvers, Mass. Uh, so maybe someone here has been there. And uh, I couldn't get a seat. And so I stood in the back. The church was packed. I literally stood leaning against the back. And uh, what happened at Howie Rich's funeral is this. First, people got up who had been young people, teenagers, and been affected by his youth ministry work. And they talked about how Howie um, accepted them where they were, how Howie uh, uh, always came to their football games or to their track meets, how Howie always opened up his house uh, and, and, and let them come in, how Howie uh, shared his faith, how Howie was funny and fun and, and generous 
and, and made sacrifices for people. And then after they spoke, the teachers from the school, some of his colleagues spoke, and they said the same thing. Howie was one of the most generous, loving people we've known. He was a, an encourager. Uh, he, he, he made us laugh. And then after they got done, the people that were in his, his church community, they got up and talked about how Howie as a pastor had ministered to them and helped them through many experiences in their lives. It was beautiful. Then the most amazing thing happened. After all that, his wife and his two kids who were sitting in the front row, they got up. And they got up and they said basically this. They didn't say exactly like this, but basically what they said was this. You know what, folks? You got it right. You got it right. That's Howie. That's how we experience Howie too. You just, that's the guy we know. And you beautifully eulogized him. I was driving home, still thinking about the funeral and how powerful it was. And you know, you're driving sometimes, you got the radio on, and say, I gotta turn the radio off. I turn the radio off and I'm thinking about it. And you know, when you get to be my age, you start thinking about your own funeral. And I thought this, I thought, you know, what a beautiful funeral and what a testimonial to Howie. And I wonder if, if I were to die, you know, you were, you were, would anyone come? Yeah. So I said, yeah, I bet people would come. People would come to my funeral. And would people get up and say nice things about me? I drove. After a couple miles, I said, yeah, I think there's probably some people that might say something positive about Dan Ponsetto. But then I got hit with this, and it really hit me. I thought this. If that happened, would the wife and kids sitting in the front row recognize the person being described. Dostoevsky's right. Love is a terribly difficult thing. It's easy to do when people are applauding, when everyone can see it, right? But who are you when you go home? Who are you with your roommates, with your mom and dad, with your brother and sister, with your friends? That's hard. A couple years ago, you know, many years ago when Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast, I don't go on Appalachia. So my, my Appalachia was, I took several trips down to the Gulf Coast. I took faculty administrators down there. I took, we took students down there on several trips. And students still go there. And I'm going to tell you if, you, if you let me come on your Appalachia trip, how many are going to go on Appalachia? So, okay, if I were on your Appalachia trip, I'm going to brag right now. I promise you, brother, I'd be the first one up in the morning. I'd be the last one to bed. If they said, okay, we need people to come over here, we've got uh, 45 dead dogs, and someone's got to pick them up and take them down to the dump, I'd say, let's go. Let's get the dead dogs and do it, right? I'm a hero, man. I could do it. What, am, what, what are we doing? We're here to serve. Let's do it, right? I'm sorry, dead dog. I just made that up. <laughs> but what? Who cares, right? Who cares if I come home from Appalachia and I'm a jackass to my wife and I'm critical of my kids and I'm impatient and I complain about what I have to do. So love is not only a verb and it's a commitment, but it's local. It's local. And the most important people that you're called to love are not in Nicaragua and they're, they're not in Boston and they're not in the Appalachia region. They, they live with you every day. We should continue to go into Boston. We should continue to go into the rural, into, into international areas where we can have encounters that will continue to challenge us and help us think about what this life is like. But we have to focus on where we live every day. And I think that's where Dostoevsky was getting at when he talked about love being difficult. Fortitude, labor. And that gets us to Ben and Jerry's. I love Ben and Jerry's. I really like Ben and Jerry's a lot. Who likes Ben and Jerry's? Who, would, who does not like Ben and Jerry's? What? It's crazy. So Ben and Jerry's, love it. And I love, and I, I, I've seen through the years, you know, I've always kind of liked their approach. Early on, they always were committed to sustainable types of farming practices. They took care of the land. They took care of their waste. They were progressive in terms of how they treated their workers um, and all that. And so I, I like Ben and Jerry's. And I remember the first time I saw that bumper sticker. Have you ever seen that bumper sticker? If it's not fun, why do it? I think it's probably phasing out. First time I saw it, you know, on the face of it, you think, yeah, that makes sense, right? I mean, 
Who wants to spend their life doing stuff that you're not happy or passionate about? So at one level, it makes sense. Don't waste your life doing something that's not interesting, that, you don't, that doesn't bring you joy, right? That's not, you know, over, overall, something fun, something that you find interesting. But when you really think about that, if it's not fun, why do it? Imagine if we all lived by that philosophy, right? If it's not fun, why do it? Let me tell you, if love had to be fun, my wife would have left me years ago. If love had to be fun, I would have bailed on parenting every time one of my four kids turned about two and a half years old. It was not fun. Lying there in the checkout counter of a grocery store in a pool of water in their winter coat and galoshes, screaming and kicking because I won't buy them a Three Musketeers bar. You know? I just, that's not fun. I just moved to another, another aisle and say, I'm, not, I'm done here. That's, that's not fun. So I'm going to take care of this kid on aisle four here, you know. <clears throat> not fun. If love had to be fun, my mother would not have spent the last six months of my father's life as he died of cancer, getting him out of bed, dressing him, eventually feeding him, helping him go to the bathroom. And my mother-in-law did the same thing for my father-in-law for even longer. Not fun. If you asked my mother, was that fun? She would have said, no. It was awful. It was, it was painful. It was difficult. And there were times I thought that I'm going to die before he dies. But if you asked her, was it a source of joy? She'd say, yeah. Oh, yeah. Never a question. Never a question. Love does not have to be fun. And it often isn't. But you love and you do what you do because it's right. Right? It's right. It's the right thing to do. So I'm going to wrap up. I want to give you, um, go back to this verb and this noun thing. First, I've already said it to some. Love is a verb. It's something you commit to. If it's worthwhile, if it's captured you, if you value it, then you got to work at it. And it takes a lifetime. And it's worth it. And it's not just people. It's ideas. It's communities. It's justice. It's doing the right thing. And it takes work. So love's a verb. It's not always fun. And it's local, primarily. Start there. Love's also a noun. And I haven't talked about that yet. I'm going to close with this. Love is a noun. It's something that you experience. It's something that you give to another person. It's something that people give to you. It's something you receive and you share. And I'm not sure why you come to Agape Latte, right? I don't know what brings you here. Um, and I don't know um, if, um, if, you, if, if God is a part of it or not a part of it. But our capacity to really commit to love and to love people, I think is rooted very deeply in our own experience of knowing that we are loved, of knowing that at our core, we are precious in God's eye and loved deeply. And so, whether you believe it or not, I'm making an announcement tonight. God loves you very much. And if you know that, Keep working at it. If you don't know it, then I want to proposition you. I'm going to ask you to, to consider one thing. To know that God loves you, you have to put yourself in a position for God to love you. I remember my youngest daughter, Maddie, who's your age, in college in another school, once said to me as a little girl, she said, Dad, I want to love God, but I don't know how. You know, beautiful. She's probably seven years old. I don't see God. I don't know how to do it. Here's what I'd recommend. It's something that I depend on. If you can find a place where you can be quiet and just sit, and you could discipline yourself to do it every day, get a cup of coffee, take a nice cup of tea, and just go sit. And don't do anything. Just be quiet. And just don't try to do anything. If you don't want to do anything, just sit and be silent. Try it for five minutes. Give yourself that gift. 
And if you have to pray anything, pray this. Here I am. Here I am. If you invite God with here I am, I promise you, God will come to meet you. Happy Valentine's Day. Thanks for having me tonight.